Thank you, Joe. A quick missions update, being the first Sunday of the month, and I think we put in the bulletin uh, today as well, a reminder um, when we had the virus hit and we changed some things, uh, one of the things we did was put the basket for your offering in the back, and that has worked well, so we've continued to keep it there. But we used to also pass a second offering on the first Sunday, strictly for missions giving. So just as a reminder, we, we're not going to pass it in the sanctuary, but you can place your specific missions offering on the first Sunday, actually any Sunday, but for sure the first Sunday in the basket in the back. We thank you for that. This month of October, we are looking locally to the various missions that take care of those who are uh, needy, less fortunate in, uh, in many different ways than we are. And so the Baltimore Rescue Mission, the Helping Up Mission, uh, both centered downtown, uh, actually right around the corner from each other, and also the Women of Worth, which is centered over in Essex, and um, they, they have outreaches all over, um, primarily eastern Baltimore County. And uh, again, when the virus hit, they were told to not come into the city. So they followed that plea, at least initially. I think they're crossing over into the city at times now uh, in any event. So uh, we are able to help three separate mission outreaches, and they all do a lot of good work, primarily uh, spreading the gospel. Uh, it's one of those conditional things. We'll help you if you do this. You sit and listen to the gospel, and, and uh, we'll help take care of your needs. So we're getting the, the word of the Lord out. Uh, next month is India. And uh, again, as I, as I say every year at this time, we do it in November because primarily Dr. Samuel Baraga over in Hyderabad, he runs the Bharat Bible College, and they do an all-out blitz into the surrounding communities and villages. If you know anything at all about India, they've got more people per square foot than anywhere else in the world. Uh, just you can't go very far without bumping into a lot of people. So they get the gospel message out to a lot of people in December. But we also support um, Bishop Pathros and uh, Reverend Biswas's ministry, his daughter and her husband have taken over that since he went on to heaven. And so that covers quite a bit of territory from the Himalayas down into southern India, and obviously a lot of people. And in December, we are splitting our outreach again to uh, SAT7, S-A-T stands for satellite. Uh, it's a new outreach for us. It is satellite TV that uh, goes into a lot of Middle Eastern countries in particular, over in the area of uh, North Africa, the Middle East, Turkey, um, some of the islands in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And much like Christian radio crosses borders uh, that humans uh, are often restricted uh, from, satellite TV is able to get into areas as well with the gospel. And a lot of it is geared to the children. I think I mentioned the last time I spoke about this, uh, a lot of their programming is based on, or it's similar to uh, the Veggie Tales videos that kids here in America see, um, which is uh, a very effective outreach for children. And so we will support them, as well as the Rendili outreach in Kenya. Uh, Rendili is the area where our missionary Judith Collins has been for over 50 years, if you recall, Judith had a stroke and a heart attack simultaneously um, less than a year ago now. She is still uh, recuperating. She is in a nursing home. She still cannot speak. Uh, she does not have full use of, I think it's the left side of her body. But her missions outreach continues on. There are people in place to continue to carry that on. So we're going to continue to support the outreach and, uh, and help Judith whenever and wherever we can as well. 
and the, and the mission board is doing the same thing. So those are our outreaches uh, coming up through the end of the year. Again, you are always invited to join us when we have our missions meeting. It's an open meeting. Uh, we have heard from so many of you over the years that we've gotten new outreaches because of it. And um, one of the, and I'm trying not to bleed over into the announcements here, but one of those outreaches well, years ago was Chosen People Ministries, which is an outreach to the Jewish people. And out of that, we have become good friends with Rabbi Neil and Kim Saraski, and the rabbi will be here next week uh, to bring the message and then join us for lunch with a question and answer session on uh, what he will be speaking on. So we look forward to seeing our, our brother Neil again. It's, it's been a while. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful and thankful for our outreaches, for all the missions work. Lord, you have uh, put it in so many people's hearts to serve and to serve on the field, and that often brings with it a great danger. There are missionaries who will lose their lives today. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, just give them the strength they need to go through with that, give them the peace of mind, knowing that uh, to be absent from the body is to, is to be present with the Lord. And uh, we rest easy, Lord, on your promises and your scriptures, which we have uh, hidden in our hearts. And so, Lord, we are grateful for those who are willing to go on the front lines and serve. But thank you also, Father, for those who are here on the home front, and we have service to do as well as we have family and friends and acquaintances who need to hear the gospel message. But I thank you for the prayers that are offered up by the home folks and by the support as well that they are able to give uh, that your missionaries around the world can, can get into places where, uh, where people still have not heard the wonderful gospel message of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we Thank you for all of these efforts and uh, all that the folks here at Cub Hill have done uh, over the many years. We're forever grateful for that. Thank you for those who are here today, Lord. And uh, we are grateful every morning when you wake us up and give us another day of life. And uh, all that awaits us, we don't often don't have any idea what's coming around the next bend, but... You do, Lord, and we put all of our faith and our trust and our hope in you. And again, we're thankful uh, that we walk with you uh, along life's path. We do lift some of the members of our family, Lord, who are in need of prayer. They're in need of continued healing. Uh, they're in need of strength and encouragement. We think of Dwayne and Madi and and Larry and, and Monica as well, Lord. And um, it's Larry Forsyth. I know we have a few Larrys, so Lord, let me uh, stipulate that um, Larry is healing from a, from a terrible fall he took. And uh, Lord, again, we're thankful for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, we, we hurt when they hurt, Lord, and we lift them in prayer. And we ask, Lord, for, for your healing touch as only you can give. We continue to pray for our nation. Uh, Lord, it's mind-boggling the things that are going on now that we would have never imagined just a few short years ago. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to be merciful to America, that uh, for the sake of the righteous in the land, Lord, you, with, you would withhold your, uh, your further judgment. We do believe that uh, you have judged our land in, in certain ways, but Father, please, we just pray that you would continue to uh, keep us uh, free, the freedoms that, that are still here, and we know they all come from you. And uh, use us, Lord, as you have down through the centuries, and we pray that you would continue to do so. Bless our service, Lord, uh, especially the part where we observe the Lord's Supper and what Jesus did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. Uh, bless our time together. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.
Okay, the aforementioned announcements. Welcome to all. Uh, and I try to look around initially to see if anyone is new, but I see you all are returnees, and we're grateful. And so uh, good to see you today. We do have a ladies' Bible study this coming Thursday, the first Thursday of every month at 7.30 p.m. down in the Fellowship Hall. At 7 o'clock, we open it up for a time of prayer. Anyone can join the ladies for that. Uh, The men's prayer breakfast will be this coming Saturday, October 7th at 7.30 a.m. at Bob Evans over on Bel Air Road. And again, that's open to all the men if you care to join us. We always have a a good time of fellowship and uh, prayer as well. And it's good to pray in public. We, uh, on more than one occasion when we finish praying, someone at another table will come over and say, thank you. We appreciate seeing people publicly pray to the Lord. And um, it's it's always good uh, to represent our Lord wherever we go. The um, Solid Ground Committee uh, will meet here at the church this coming Saturday at noon. Those of you on who are on the committee uh, know we have a, a lot planned that day. So, um, in fact, the committee should probably be here before noon. If you want to come out around 11, that would be terrific. Uh, we look forward to that. Uh, next Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, Rabbi Saraski, Neil, and his wife, Kim, will be here. Uh, he will be bringing a message on the feast we are um, during right now is is during the time of the feasts in the uh, Jewish church or temple or synagogue, and uh, we will find out more about what's going on there. Rabbi Saraski, by the way, is a believer. He has a um, church, a Bible-believing Messianic church in Northern Virginia. He lives in Columbia, but he ministers in Northern Virginia. Uh, We've been to his church for service. And um, he, he does a, a good job from a very Jewish perspective, which is good to know. We need to know more about that uh, as Christians than, than we do. I think some of us have kind of, you know, dipped our toe in the water, so to speak. But um, there's, there's a lot about our Lord Jesus throughout the Old Testament scriptures. So Neil will bring a lot next Sunday. Our next Operation Christmas Child event is our packing party, October 22nd, which is three weeks from today. So it'll be after our church service. Those of you who have participated before uh, know how we do that. Just go down uh, afterwards and and pack the shoe boxes, and we'll, of course, give you something to munch on, because that's what we do. But there is a sign-up sheet on the events board. Please let us know if you're coming. That will help us with, with the food, if, if nothing else. Uh, let me see what else we have here. I think that's it for all the new things. The October Defender is on the back table. Uh, if any of you heard my radio uh, broadcast this morning, I mentioned the full-page ad that the um, seminary that is associated with the a very liberal evangelical Lutheran church in America, the ad that they took out in the Gettysburg Times, uh, that is in that defender. So if you want to take a look at that uh, and and then pray for those folks, please. Uh, they're knee-deep in apostasy, probably eyeball-deep in it at this point. So is there anything else am I missing? No? We good? Our scripture reading is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Please stand for the reading of God's word. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily 
was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Please be seated. Now Pastor Dave will bless us with his message, Bought with a Price. We, we talk a lot about what little value we as human beings can offer Almighty God, our sovereign creator, ruler of the universe and everything that's in it. We talk about our limitations that are manifested in our finiteness. We were talking in Sunday school a little bit about how us finite creatures think we can control the infinite God. That'll make you laugh, won't it? And uh, how these limitations that we have pale in comparison to God's omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. The fact that he is infinite in all things. In fact, there is no comparison. It's fruitless. It's foolish to even let our minds wander in that direction. It would be kind of akin to a group of nuclear physicists sitting around the table, maybe discussing the pros and cons of nuclear power. And then asking a fly on the wall what he thought about it. And that's probably not a real good analogy. The fly might do a better job than we would assisting the Lord in anything. So when we consider that God paid a price for our redemption, it might cause us, in fact, it should cause us to wonder why. I think we can immediately rule out any thoughts that we might in any way, shape, or form be worthy of this particular transaction. In fact, I would say to perish those thoughts. It's nothing but pride trying to worm its way, as it usually does, into the discussion. There is nothing on our end that is even worthy of discussion. So you ask, what is it then? What do we know about God that would even cause him to look in our direction, to pay any attention to us at all? We know who we are, don't we? We look in the mirror. We know what our shortcomings are. Well, what else could it be but his love? Again, another subject that we know so little about. But we do know enough about it to know that his love is real. We certainly don't deserve it. But we are grateful. We're grateful that he feels that way. He loves us so much, Romans 5 verse 8 tells us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For us. For you and for me. What does that mean while we were yet sinners? While we were still in our sinful condition? Jesus gave up the glory of heaven. And we won't even begin to understand what that means until we get there. And get a glimpse of what he left behind. For the pain and humiliation of the cross. Well that certainly was a manifestation of God's love. But look a little bit deeper. While we were yet sinners, what does that mean? It means that Jesus meets us where we are. While we were dead in our sins, he came to us. He didn't wait for us to improve our position, even if we could. That's called unconditional love. Are you and I like that? Well, I know we'd like to think we are. 
but I think we know better. We put conditions on our affections for one another, don't we? We keep score. And we don't say this out loud, but we might be thinking, all right, you got me this time, but I'll get you next time. We may say it lovingly, but it's always in our heart. That aspect of getting even. Revenge. It's certainly not anything we're proud of, but it does reveal who we are. Sinful humans. With loving hearts, maybe, but also, as Jeremiah tells us, with hearts deceitful above all things. Hearts that are desperately wicked. Desperately, what's that mean? That means you'll do anything to be wicked. We're desperate to be wicked. The same hearts that Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, 19, that bring forth evil thoughts. Thoughts of murder and adultery, fornication, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. That's who we are. Who God is, is found in 1 Corinthians 13. Whereas our love is conditional, his is unconditional. Agape love, it's called. It doesn't envy or puff itself up. It doesn't behave unseemly. It doesn't even think anything evil. And his love never, ever fails. So now, hopefully, we have at least an inkling as to why God would pay the price, the ultimate price, to save us. By dying on the cross, Jesus redeemed us from our bondage to sin. And in Ephesians 1, 7, Paul tells us the meaning of that redemption. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The ransom was paid in blood. And that in turn, of course, removed us from the curse of the law. As we read in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. The cross made from a tree. And the result of that is that we are released from the bondage of sin. We're released from sin into the freedom of grace, all through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Because as Hebrews 9.22 tells us, there is no remission without the shedding of blood. Now our text that Joe read for us says we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. People may think that they can show up at heaven's gate with all the gold in Fort Knox, all the silver in South America's silver mines, and get in. It won't do them any good. Not at all. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? The price that was paid for us was the ultimate price, which is far more than gold or silver. On a on another note, a human note, if you will, we have our freedom as a nation because men and women paid the ultimate price in battle. We remember that as a nation on Memorial Day every year, but we should remember that every day of the year, what price people paid for maintaining the freedoms given to us from our Lord. We have our freedom from sin and from hell because Jesus paid the ultimate price, and he paid that price in our place. 
We were bought with a price. And I might add that it's a high honor that mankind is the only redeemed creature in the universe. We alone cost the Lord his life. Rebellious angels, one-third of the Lord's celestial beings, they lost their first estate, but they fell to their doom and were left there. No price has ever been paid for them. Man stands alone in this respect. But again, we have to consider the price. When you think that God could speak the worlds into existence in a brief moment of time, creating everything from the largest constellations out there in the sky to the smallest insects crawling on the earth, and then realize that to redeem us from our sin, he had to endure the loss of his only begotten son. He couldn't speak our redemption into existence like he did the heavens and the earth. He couldn't do that because, again, our sin required that someone had to die. Blood had to be shed. The wages of sin is death. We have been redeemed in reference to divine justice. We violated God's law, and therefore a punishment had to be exacted from us. And this is the punishment that Jesus endured in our place. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We read this from the prophet Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. We get to go free. Because he suffered in our place. Whatever was due from us, he took care of and honored the law of God in the process. We are not our own, 1 Corinthians 6.19 says. And let me just say that that is history's greatest trade-off. As believers, what have we surrendered? We have surrendered our right and our property in ourselves. But look at what we have received in return. Life. And life eternal, the scripture tells us. If we had retained that supposed right to ourselves, we would die and we would go to hell. Prior to salvation, even though we live physically, we're still dead. We may have been living in great pleasure, but because we were spiritually dead, we had no future. But now through Jesus, we've received nobility through our promise of eternal life. We are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. It doesn't get any higher than that. I'd say that's fair compensation for giving up sin for a season. We've also been given peace because now we are at rest forever in Jesus. There's also joy and hope. The price that Jesus paid for you and for me is truly the gift that keeps on giving all throughout eternity. Look back over the history of your own life. I'm sure many of you have made some good investments along the way. Houses can be an example of that. We usually upgrade them as we go through our lives. Our careers may 
take off. Maybe we make more money. Maybe we have more kids, so we need a bigger house. Maybe a better house. So with everything else being equal, and I know there's never any guarantee of that, we usually move through life raising our standard of living. But what happens at the end? It all ends, doesn't it? Nothing stays as it was. Maybe you live to be 100 and find as your health deteriorates, you have to go in the opposite direction. You have to downsize. My mom went through that just a few years ago, literally just a few years ago. 25 years ago, her and my dad had two homes, a summer home at the beach and a winter home in Florida. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Ten years later, mom had been reduced to living in two rooms in an assistant living facility. And from there, it was one bed in a room that she shared with someone else and a wheelchair in a nursing home. That's if you are fortunate to live to a ripe old age. My mom made it to 96. I look at my brother Bob here. His mom was in very similar circumstances. She made it to 97. But she certainly didn't live in a facility that she had during her adult years prior to that. Many of you have a similar story. And that is the best that life can offer. Of course, if you die when you're young, everything disappears automatically, doesn't it? But that's what we get for the price that we pay. But as a believer, you were bought. You were bought with a much greater price. We've talked at length about what it costs Jesus but what did it benefit us? Peace and joy, they're wonderful gifts, and they're certainly something that we can enjoy to the fullest in this life. But it's only when you link them to the hope that we find in Christ that you can begin to understand how lasting the gift really is. When we're young and healthy, we think we're bulletproof. We don't think about dying when we're young. Our hope isn't in the Lord then either. It's in us. It's what can I do next? It's how much money can I make this year? That, by the way, is one of the dangers of success, particularly to the Christian, because we start to think it is us. We start believing our press clippings, and we forget about the Lord. Little by little, we edge him out. Remember that word ego is nothing more than an acronym for edging God out. We look to him when we need help, of course, when we're down and out. But when we're on top, we often don't give him the time of day. Instead of opening your Bible first thing in the morning, maybe you're going to the stock market. See how you did last night. If you find that you're not walking as closely with God as you used to, remember he's not the one who has moved. But as we get older, we little by little start feeling the effects of the aging process, don't we? It causes us to start looking at things a little differently than we used to. An expression we often hear in sports is the future is now. But that applies to us too as we move through the years. Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. 
As a Christian, as a believer, we have a unique perspective on the future. Instead of death lurking on a horizon as something that is dark and ominous, we're now able to look across that valley to a better land. Death is but a doorway into heaven for the believer. Look forward to the future. Look forward to it with hope and with joy. Don't remember the past with sadness and regret. It's the worst thing you can do moving forward is live in the past. We all have regrets. You could just wallow in them all day long if you choose to, but why? We have hope. We have joy awaiting us. Look to a hope of immortality with Christ, of likeness to him, of being in his presence, as well as the presence of all the saints who are in heaven today. They've gone on ahead of us. Loved ones who died trusting in Christ alone for their salvation. Did I happen to mention it lasts forever? Kind of takes the shine off of that beach house, doesn't it? Now, here's the real value. I love messages that come from Scripture. They're the best because there's always a step that takes you deeper, isn't there? And the deeper you go, the more you learn, the better you feel about what is in store for us. The real value of the price that was paid for our redemption. You see, if Jesus was redeeming us from an earthly kingdom, you might have attached more worth to what he did. If you had wealth untold, all the glamour and the glitz of the world, then you might have given the price that Jesus paid more value. If you had all of that, if it was worth more, then maybe what Jesus did for you would have been of more value. But that's not where most of us are, is it? We have nothing. We are nothing but stubborn sinners, deceitfully wicked. Please, don't forget what Jeremiah had to say. That verse is in there for a reason. And yet Christ still paid the price, the ultimate price that was required to satisfy the justice of God. We're starting to get a little better understanding of what went on here in this transaction. The price which Jesus paid means cleansing. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We read in 1 John 1, 7. Isn't it better to be cleansed and to be the Lord's than to be filthy and be your own? The blood of Jesus brings us nearer to God. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 6, that no one comes to the Father but by him. Isn't it better to be near to the Lord and belong to Jesus than to be on your own? like the prodigal son with the slop and the pigs? I, I've so much come to appreciate the slop and the pigs with my daughter raising pigs. They are a messy sort. I didn't get saved until I was 30. So I had plenty of time to play in the slop with the pigs. I'm sure some of you may have similar stories. We all have a story. And we've come from various places, but there's enough slop out there to go around for all of us, isn't there? But the blood of Jesus has given you entrance into the most holy place, even into the very heart of God. Don't show up at heaven's gate with anything other than the blood of Jesus covering your sinful soul. Because if you do, you are not getting in. I don't care what you accomplished in this life. All of our good works are nothing but filthy rags 
the prophet Isaiah tells us. And God is not in the business of collecting rags. Someone once said to me, you mean there are no good people in heaven? And I'll just go on the human definition of good. We know what the Bible says about none of us being good. But I said, sure, there are good people in heaven. But they didn't get there by being good. They got there by trusting in the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. You know, it also works the other way. There are some pretty bad people in heaven, too. Really bad people. People who never gave God or the Bible one minute of their time, but on their deathbeds, they repented of their sin. They asked the Lord for forgiveness. The thief on the cross, and that's a Jesus. He's in that scripture for a reason. Perfect example of this. And just to let you know how despicable that man was, they normally did not crucify people for stealing. We call him a thief, but the Bible says he was a malefactor. He was an evil criminal. Tradition has it that he was a murderer. But he is in heaven today. You say, how can that be? Because of the blood of Jesus, which is sufficient for all sins. 1 John 1, 9 says that we confess our sins to God. He is faithful and just to forgive us. If you haven't asked God yet to forgive you, to put you in right standing with him, please get out of the salvation business. We, we can't make that work from our perspective. You'll fall short, just like we fall short in everything else in life compared to what Jesus did for us. And I cannot stress this enough. If you're in that situation, do not let the sun go down today if you haven't placed your trust in Jesus. Don't wait until you are on your deathbed. Sudden death comes suddenly. You may not have time on your deathbed to make amends. Tomorrow's promise to no one. People are still dying every day without warning. Isn't it better to be part of the forever family of God, to be able to speak with him as you would speak with a friend, than to be on your own, shut out from God? and from the glory that is in heaven forever. And if you're hesitating, because you're not sure of what you'd have to give up, I've heard that excuse too. Is the Christian life a life of self-denial? Sometimes it is. But please make sure you're looking at this commitment from an eternal perspective and not just what's going on this weekend. Whatever this life has to offer you, it is at best temporary. Again, it all disappears at the grave. But your soul doesn't. Your soul is going to live on forever, either in heaven or in hell. Better to ponder the compensations of heaven, unimaginably rich, bought and paid for by the Lord himself. Can your friends offer you that? Can you accomplish it on your own? The devil would have you believe that you can. Please don't fall for his lies. We have been set free from Satan. We've been set free because Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. So let's go out there and live our lives the way we should. Let's be the men and the women that God has called us to be. And let's remember the price that he paid on our behalf as we ready ourselves to approach the communion table.
We're about to partake of this sacred supper, which our Lord instituted many years ago as the covenant meal of the New Testament. We look back here and commemorate his death on our behalf, as we have just been speaking of in our message today. We commemorate his death on our behalf and reaffirm our covenant privileges and our responsibility in the present, while also anticipating his future return. Jesus is spiritually present with us today in the elements of the bread and the cup as we set them apart. He is not physically present. Though the bread remains bread and the cup remains cup, they do become the body and blood of Jesus spiritually. It is symbolic. We enjoy fellowship with him as we feed upon him by faith in our hearts. We enjoy communion with him, and therefore we receive his grace in a way unlike that which we receive at any other point in the life of the church. Here our souls get fed. We find refreshment. We are renewed. We are strengthened. So we would ask the Lord to sanctify this bread and cup and set it apart for this use. By this sacrament, Christ and all his benefits are applied and sealed up unto us. Now, it is required in the scriptures that you be a sincere and accountable believer in Jesus Christ. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And again, if you're an unbeliever or an unrepentant believer, we would ask that you do not participate. We invite you instead to remain among us and ask the Lord to speak to your heart, giving you understanding. Of course, if you are a sincere believer walking obediently with the Lord and accountable to him alone, we invite you to partake of the element. Here are the promises of God to those who truly repent of their sins and trust in Christ. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do ask you to set this bread and cup apart to sanctify it for its use today, dear Lord. We're a grateful people for what Jesus has done, coming to this earth while we were yet in our sin and paying the ultimate price for us on the cross. Have us, Lord, turn our thoughts to you now. Have us put our mind on you and you alone as we remember what Christ did for us on the cross. Brother Joe, if you would pray for the bread, please. Let us pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for giving us this bread of life, your body, that we may believe in you and glorify you and the Father and Spirit and have eternal life. We thank you, our Lord, for your life of obedience and suffering for us, even to the cruel death on the cross, so that we can have your righteousness. Your body was broken for us as we break this bread, which symbolizes your body. Amen. Got to make sure our folks watching online are part of this as well. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me, and we do the same. The cup, a symbol of his blood that he shed for us. He came into this world knowing that he would give his life 
in a horrible way because he loved us. Each day that we breathe, we are reminded that because of his shed blood, we walk. And we have a promise of life with him. He's already prepared it for us. We are grateful. We are thankful to take this time to remember the cup, his blood. Thank you, Jesus. In the same manner, after he had taken the cup and blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is the new covenant which is in my blood, which has been poured out to many for the remission of sin. Drink if you're trusting in this as well. Father in heaven, we again are so thankful for what you did on our behalf. We do this in remembrance of that. But Lord, keep it on our minds each and every day as we go through this life on earth, the great price that was paid, a price that we could not pay ourselves. We are forever grateful and thankful. It should well up inside of us to the point where we can't wait to share this wonderful message with others as someone once shared it with us. So bless us this day, dear Lord. Open our eyes to the opportunities you send our way. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.